Hey, what's up, everybody? And thank you for listening to Operation Agency Freedom, where we are bringing you top secret advice from the world's most badass digital agency owners and influencers. These amazing men and women are sharing their stories of how they have built six, seven, and eight figure digital agencies and how you can too. My name is Chris Martinez, CEO of Dude, where we are helping digital agencies by giving them the people and the processes so that they can scale profitably. Today, I'm joined by my homies, my buddies in San Diego, Joe Fear and Matt Wolf from Evergreen Profits and the Hustle and Flowchart Podcast. What's up, guys? What's happening, Chris? Thanks Yo. for having us. Good Thanks for having us. Guys. Yeah, good to see you guys, even though you're not repping your, uh, your, dude, your dude gear. I know. We should all have hats on. <laughs> didn't we give you guys the shirts, too? Yeah, we have everything. We're just, okay. we didn't come prepared. Sorry. I actually... I honestly wear my dude hat all the time. It's actually one that I do wear around town quite a bit. <laughs> you guys know Ted Lucere. He is always wearing his dude hat. And if there's anybody who needs to wear the dude hat, it's Ted. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, I'm such the dude. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. I, I use it for, uh, I've taken up pickleball with my parents. It's a mm-hmm. very old person sport, but it's actually, yeah. and that's my, that's where I wear the dude hat. Most. That's your, uh, maybe we should, that's, that's a marketing niche that we could go <laughs> after, pickleball uniforms. I'm going to blow it up for you. <laughs> nice. Thank you for that. <laughs> yeah. All right. So we're going to get into your guys' story in a second, but as we start every show, we have a little round table discussion and this is one that I'm very, very excited to hear about from you guys. So Joe, you yes. used to work at Burger King when you were a kid, yep. or maybe, maybe it was last year. I don't know. Um, <laughs> you used to work in foods, fast food service. I, when I was a kid, I used to work at Chuck E. Cheese. And then uh-huh. I learned that you used to work at a deli and also um, doing the concession stand at like uh, at a, at a venue, you know, like a concert venue, I think. It yeah, was. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, Joe's still waiting to quit his job. Like, he I'm, kind of I'm, hoping I'm still to hit like, that. I have all these fryer burns from making the fries because that was my job, is my job, I guess. Right. Yeah. Awesome. Joe's hoping to one day finally quit the job at Burger King. Yeah. Well, you know, you, you just stick around for the benefits. It's worth it. <laughs> well, that, and the good conversations. You never know who you Yeah, doing. absolutely. All right, Joe. So let's hear some of your war stories from when you worked at Burger King. So, wow. Anything specific? Because I can go all that. Dude, it's... Working these kind of jobs, you like the people, I would say are the most fun, entertaining part of the business, like the people you're working with. They're, oh, the people that you're working with. Okay, well, we, dude, just start off, talk about some of those experiences, some of maybe oh, some of the man. things that you learned working in food service. Dude, we could make right. such like a, a brand new podcast that's just like dudes talking about crappy jobs they've had. <laughs> yeah, I mean, everyone relates, right, in some way. <laughs> yeah, for yeah, sure. I, so it was cool at, at Burger King, we all helped like it was one of our friends got me a job and they got my other friend a job. And basically it turned out to be like eight of us, like this mm-hmm. crew all went to BK lounge is what we call it. <laughs> nice. <laughs> and it was just a screw around time, but we had a good time. We did, did the work and uh, I don't know. It was weird because that pot of friends, like we just helped each other get jobs. Like yep. probably for Dude, that's every years. high school. I was like, there was a subway by my house. Uh-huh. There was like probably 10 people that got a job at subway. And yeah, actually, man. Geez, same thing. There was like another 10 people from my high school. Yeah. I don't know, BK Labs, they did offer me a manager position, but it was like crazy responsibilities and like $1 more. I was like, ah, I'm going to go work at this deli for like double the price and half the responsibilities. Bye. Nice. So mm-hmm. that's, that was so nice. Intimate. Was it the same deli that Matt was working at? No, we didn't know each other back then. Oh, but that'd be okay. interesting. Matt, yeah, what, what was the deli? I don't even know much about it. Let's, let's hear about this deli story, Matt. So the deli I worked at was actually called Giovanni's and it was it was actually one of my neighbor's parents owned the deli. So that's how I got that job while in okay. high school was uh, a neighbor who lived, you know, 10 houses up from me in my neighborhood. Um, they decided one day to buy a deli <laughs> and they got, they got it going and they just recruited the neighborhood kids. Cause they found out that they could basically pay them minimum wage and give them a, a sandwich every day. And that would be enough to keep them happy. So uh, <laughs> that's, that's what I did. It's funny because I don't think I've actually talked about like pretty much whenever we tell our, our stories, like in business, it always starts from the shutter company on. I never yeah. really talk about like anything prior to me working at the, the, the our family business, the shutter company. Um, so like, well, I don't even I mean, know if I remember you, many stories because I never, ever talk about that job. I mean, just to set the stage, you know, we are very investigatory journalists here. So we <laughs> go way back. I do I remember, remember there was a... Be- there was one of the cooks in the back and you know I was like maybe 16 at the time and we used to we used to have them go down to the liquor store and buy us playboys. 
There's there's oh, one more story. Nice. Dude, right, I, remember so I, gotta, I gotta throw in a story. This is not BK. <laughs> that the deli I worked at after BK it was attached to a bakery. So it was in a grocery store. And the baker in the back was named as Pops. And that's what we all called him. Uh, Freaking old, old Mexican dude. Amazing guy. Funniest guy ever. Dirty. Dirty man. <laughs> Horribly dirty man. You don't man. necessarily want to hear the words dirty and baker together. <laughs> well... It's getting better because he made erotic cakes behind the scenes. I swear to God, it was like off the menu, but it was like, hey, but he had his clients and he was busy. I was like, dude. And this okay, uh, without going into detail or maybe going into detail, I we don't have it. There's no censors here. (laughs) What were some of the designs that people were requesting? You got to think that the guy had a lot of material back there and it was all, he was old. So it was from the eighties and like, it was, Oh my God. And literally this is a dirty old man that like, <laughs> makes dirty cakes. Cakes. he had pictures of all sorts of things you can think of. The oh my God. And the, <laughs> any color, any, like it, any, any audience too. Like it didn't matter who bought this. You saw all walks of life buying these cakes and like the yeah, most yeah. Instant looking people you're like, Wow, you're getting a big dick cake or something with like oh my God. graphic details, oh. and they're like, "Whoa, this is getting weird, man." Oh my God. <laughs> but man, it was great because I knew when the clients were coming to pick up the cake, and it had to be all discreet. So I'd yeah, be like, yeah. be like Haha, "You're the one." <laughs> it's so like you some remember, little old you remember, lady. That, huh? you remember that jerk that was like, "Hey guys, here's your dick cake." <laughs> and like announced it as you were handing it to the the people the customers it wasn't, it wasn't my job to deliver the cake that was all him man you know that this conversation could degrade really really quickly if we keep going down this rabbit hole That's i want to know I'm, i want to know if pops is still working there because i i don't even need to buy a cake for anybody but i will find a reason <laughs> unfortunately pops uh lost his job in the whole freaking grocery store went down but i'm sure he's baking somewhere and i'm sure his clientele is still around how old was he back then? Maybe he's. He maybe he's. Uh, uh, I hope he's not. But yeah. <laughs> he was pretty old. Maybe he's uh, baking penises in that big bakery in the sky by now. You know what? He was a happy man. So wherever he's at, he's having a good time. <laughs> There's so many marketing lessons that we could probably learn from pops. There's and a just life, for anything and life lessons in general. Just you know, <laughs> do your thing. <laughs> so this is how I learned all my marketing skills was from Pops. So, there you go. <laughs> that, that can be your his next books. Everything I learned from about marketing, I learned from the baker who made dick cakes. <laughs> <Your story. laughs> all right. We're all gonna right, make so, it, we're gonna title that a podcast at some point. It's going to happen. We'll Everything I know about shit. marketing, I learned from dick cakes. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta just give me credit for that one. I will. <laughs> You'll be on the show. You'll be- Perfect. <laughs> all right. Um, all right. So let's let's get back to the serious stuff. <laughs> Not really. We never talk about anything serious. But you guys started an agency back in 2008, right? So you guys have been in this business. Like when you think about it, like that was freaking light years away. So let's talk about where you guys started and, and how it kind of got kicked off and all that stuff. And we'll just kind of take it from there. Yeah. yeah. So we, we started our business together in, in 07, actually. Um, We didn't actually start doing agency work until like 09-ish and then really went deep on agency work in about 2013. So it was kind of like the sort of, we did some agency stuff, decided we didn't like it, brought it back in, decided we didn't like it, brought it back. (laughs) So, you know, we kind of have had an off and on agency. Mm -hmm. Um, But I'll let let Joe kind of tell more of the story because he's been much more in the agency world than I have in our business. That is true. Yeah. And uh, so then I started off blogging and content marketing is like mm-hmm. the big thing. And then over time, we kind of like, we always worked together, but it's one of these like diversion, like where Matt kind of did more info product stuff where I took more of the agency route and helped a lot of people with their, their sales videos, you know, these big product launches that were happening back in the early 2000s. These were like the Mike Koenig's Frank Kern launches, uh, you know, all these big like million dollar launches that were going on. Um, I worked with a lot of those guys creating those videos, the webinars and all that stuff. <clears throat> and it was, it was fun. It was a crap ton of work, but it was an amazing way that helped both of us eventually like Matt and I to really grow this network. And still to this day, a lot of those people are now good friends of ours, They've been on our show, but the agency, yeah, like I was more of the client facing Matt always did more of the content stuff. And then later throughout the years, 
call it, yeah, a few years later. So then we started experimenting with the content marketing agency. So we kind of like brought both of that stuff together. Yeah. And had, it wasn't a ton of clients, but we had probably like a good 10, about 10 clients at a time paying us a good retainer. Well, I, I don't know. If, uh, so our very first agency client that we ever brought on board, I remember we were just like sweating bullets when we pitched him because we went and met him at a Starbucks <laughs> and like pitched him in person at a Starbucks. Yeah. And this was the first person we ever tried to lock into our agency. And our pitch was 10 grand plus 20% of revenue. That's right. And in our heads, we were just thinking like, if this guy says yes, we're, we're rich. We, no, we, were, we were like thing on hands, earth. Man. Like and pop and bottle, you're picking yourselves like pop and bottle. <laughs> like, wow. Yeah, and we closed the sale. We closed the sale at ten thousand dollars plus twenty percent of of um, recurring revenue. It wasn't even like twenty percent of the bump that we provided. It was legit, just twenty percent of your business. And yeah. um, we what were never you guys thought, providing? What were you guys providing? <clears throat> at that time, we actually so we were pretty much I don't know what you call it a, a full scope, full spectrum agency. Yeah, we kind of did anything agency, people yeah, wanted so. us to do in the marketing world. <laughs> if you wanted us to write a uh, sales copy for you, we, at this time back, like we sort of niched it down over time, but at that time we were kind of, if you wanted it and we knew how to do it, we would let you give us money to do it for it for you. Yeah. You know, we so with that, that, that specific client, we actually rebranded their product under a different name. We rewrote all the copy. We wrote new scripts for all the sales videos and reshot all the sales videos. We revamped his members area. We went and built out like new content. We actually hired um, content creators to actually like add additional content into his members area. So we essentially like started with like the little core business that he created and then went, okay, cool. You've got a nice little starting point. Now let us rebuild it for you. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, and that was, so that was, that was cool. And our big thing, Matt and I've always had this kind of mentality is having a retainer is great. Well, you know, one off thing, that's what I did for so many years. And it just felt like I was chasing cash. And it was all through my network. Luckily, like whenever a project would end, surprisingly, another referral would come my way. And they're all, they were always pretty warm. So I just hop on a call and usually I would close them for at least 5k to 10k right there on the spot. No problem. But were, were you guys doing it at a flat rate or was it on a monthly retainer? That one, that one was 10 K. Uh, and then 20%. Up, up well, front. yeah, that was the, that was the re re residual then. Yeah. yeah. And, we, and his product was actually on ClickBank at the time. And okay. ClickBank had an option where uh, you could just, you could have JV partners and like mm -hmm. a percentage of the sale is just off automatically split off to somebody else. So he gave us his ClickBank login. We logged in. We set up like our ClickBank details. And so 20% of every single sale of his product, just automatically every sale that happened went into our ClickBank account. And then, you know, we got our deposits from ClickBank. So it wasn't like a monthly fee. We had that 10 grand up front to do all the work. And then 20% recurring um, was kind of the retainer to make sure everything kept going. And that, that specific business, when we took at one in, in its glory days before we took it over, it was making, I don't know, like thousand dollars a month or something right in its glory days and then it started to like peter off each month and then it got to a point where it was making like 200 300 a month that's when he hired us brought us in to to revamp it and within three months of working with us we got him up to where it was making about 10 grand a month mm -hmm. and, and he so was, he was hands off with everything so he was more the content provider we were there to optimize conversions basically is what that role was yeah. So, I mean, we got 10 grand up front and roughly, you know, two grand a month, but it was, you know, sort of a fluctuating number mm -hmm. to keep it going. That's awesome, man. So uh, right now you guys are running uh, Evergreen Profits as well as the Hustle and Flow Chart podcast. So let's mm -hmm. talk a bit about what you guys are doing now. And then I'm going to want to backtrack and talk about um, the transition. Cool. Yeah. So right now Evergreen Profits is we like to call ourselves basically an education platform for marketing as a focus, but we hit on a lot of different things that almost all business owners, usually ones with that have more of an online presence. That's who we cater to. And the podcast serves as the free content that we put out to the world twice a week. And we're bringing in all sorts of experts, authors, influencers that a lot of them that we know, or, you know, people that, have mentored us throughout the years. These people that used to sometimes be my clients or people we all looked up to now they're kind of in this circle of ours and 
we just like to have good conversations and content comes from that in the form of, you know, we have the podcast, but then it turns into all sorts of different video assets, audio assets, a physical newsletter we send in the mail every month now that kind of got restarted from back in the day. So that's now a recurring element to the business. I mean, essentially what we've, what we've transitioned to is we're essentially a media company now where mm -hmm. we have, uh, we have uh, three different podcasts running right now. Um, we're in talks of, with, with other people about actually bringing other people's podcasts under our ecosystem and sort of building out a podcasting network. We have a print newsletter, which is very, very, very inexpensive. We don't actually make profit on the print newsletter but it's a way for us to get more eyeballs on our sponsors, get more eyeballs on affiliate offers that we promote. Um, we've, we've got our blog, which we write content on. So really our, our big game is we just put out tons and tons of content in the form of podcasts, blog posts, newsletters, you name it. You know, we're putting out a ton of content with the idea being that as we grow this audience, we're going to monetize this audience through sponsorships and affiliate marketing. So right now you're generating the majority of the revenue through sponsorships and affiliate marketing through the media company? Sort of. We don't have any sponsors at the moment. <clears throat> right now our income is solely generated through affiliate marketing, our newsletter, and then we've got a couple courses that we sell as well, but we're actually phasing out the courses. Uh, mm -hmm. Interesting. All right. So then now let's go backwards and let's talk about how you got to this point because started off with, well, started off doing stuff for yourself, moved mm -hmm. to agency, and then now going back to doing more stuff for yourself in the, in, in the, in the affiliate space. Yeah. It was a really interesting journey. This is why I love you guys. And, there's always <laughs> something new going on and like. And it was what? totally, I mean, what we're doing now has been pretty, is, is, to be honest, it's probably the longest we've been consistent with one thing. So, mm. cause we're going on three years with the actual business model that we've been focused on now. It just kind of took us, well, you know, we've been doing this for 12 years now. So it took us, what, nine, nine years, years, years to basically yeah. figure out the business model that we really, really like are, are passionate and excited about. But, you know, we've been doing this for the last three years and the transition really did come from uh, agency work. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> what happened was we were doing a, a content marketing agency. We sort of niched down over time to where we were the guys who just focused on making sure you're getting good content on your blog mm -hmm. and we were SEOing it and you were just getting maximum ROI from your content strategy. So that was what we sort of niched down to over time with the agency. And we had these clients, we, uh, we were charging them five grand a month on retainer. We had a handful of clients. And what we realized was we can do a really, really, really good job for them. And our income off of those clients is fixed, right? We make five grand a month off of every client that we brought on board. Mm -hmm. And if we helped a client go from 20 grand a month in sales to hundred grand a month in sales in our con with our content strategy and our SEO, we still make five grand a month. We didn't have any sort of like tier system, any sort of sliding scale based on revenue. It was just flat fee. And so what we started doing was we said, hey, why don't we test some of these content strategies that we're doing for our clients, but instead of doing it on a retainer basis as with them being one of our clients, let's do it on the basis of uh, being an affiliate. So we will go do these same content strategies. They don't pay us anything and they just give a, us a commission of sales that we generate for them. We started doing that and within three months of kind of like we were doing the agency and that kind of at the same time mm -hmm. within three months, the affiliate income uh, that we were generating from driving traffic to the same kinds of offers 10 X what we were making as an agency. And we went, why, why do we have bosses in the form of like agency clients? I'll when tell you what, uh, the, the straw that broke the camel's back in the agency world for us was <laughs> that, but paired up with, we actually got fired by two clients. One of our, both of them actually were because <laughs> it wasn't because we weren't doing a good job. We were doing a great job. We actually got them way more leads and sales than they ever did. SEO was looking great. Uh -huh. Reputation management, all that. They brought in new marketing managers. They brought in new leaders. And then they're like, ha ha, cool. Well, you did a great job. We see what you're doing. Uh, we're going to bring in our own people for like yeah, half the price or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> and, and we're like, wait, hold on. So if we do good work and make you a lot of money, then we're still cut out of the deal. Like this sucks, man. And we could have structured <laughs> stuff differently, of course, but that was like a basic flat retainer. I think it was about 5K a month on average. Five to 10 is kind of like the range. And yeah, we're like, yeah, it's great money, but we're capped. And then we can also get fired anytime that they want. Yeah. We could add contracts, all that stuff, but still it was different. Right. 
Yeah. I mean, that, that was, you know, I, I know that this podcast is actually focused a lot on agency owners, but you know, we, we struggled as an agency for reasons like that. When we did really, really, really well, we found that a lot of companies would just go and hire somebody in house and say, model what they were doing for us Mm -hmm. and then try to cut costs in their business by bringing on like a, you know, an hourly employee to sort of replace what we were doing. And that was always our big struggle. And then when we realized that, that we had sort of like infinite potential by being affiliates versus being an agency, Mm -hmm. you know, those two things combined, it was just kind of game on. Let's, let's just kind of shift our thinking on all of this. So if, if you guys could go back in time and restructure your agency, obviously it doesn't sound like you had a hard time getting clients. No. Um, if you could go back and restructure your agency so that it could be more suitable to the lifestyle that you guys wanted, what would you have done differently? I would say that's, well, that's a good question. I'll say something really quick, Matt, because I was going to say this uh, before you even asked is I'd go back and somehow find a pe- like a Matt kind of alluded to it, like some kind of retainer, but also at least a bump in our performance. So how good we are, like, I want to make sure that we get paid for our efforts. And mm-hmm. like Matt, Matt and I were looking at, because we let's talk to so many podcasts, don't, uh, you know, people on our podcast. We were looking into a website yesterday. The guy's like crushing it in SEO, but mm-hmm. is like deathly afraid of paid traffic. Okay. I was like, and we were like talking about this. We're like, holy crap. And there's subtleties that probably won't make it a good deal. But like we're an agency. We'd probably look at that guy and be like, hey, so we're going to spend like $1,000 to run some ads to prove that we know our shit. We just want to get paid back on the ads at a very minimum. If, if it's a fail, then okay, we take the hit but we just want a percentage of the increase. Like we want to a prove it to you that we can do this, but like, Hey, if that proves out and you still like us after that experiment, then let's, let's do a test period of like three months or so for yeah. a retainer, maybe to pay for ad spend, but at least get a bump in the action there. Yeah. And, and I think one of the areas that we sort of messed up with as an agency was we weren't, we got better over time, but we weren't the best at setting all the expectations up front as far as like milestones of when they can expect things. I know that Mm -hmm. there was some communication issues where we would be kind of doing stuff for the business, but we weren't really communicating with them as best as we could to let them know that this stuff was actually happening. But I think really the big thing is like upfront, I would make sure expectations are really set. These are the deliverables. This is what you can expect from us every month. This is when you can expect it by and just spell it all out. So there's never any questions. That'd be number one. And then number two is like Joe said, like I, I would want some way to get a piece of the upside if we're really just killing it for you. If we take you from 10,000 a month to a hundred thousand a month in sales, I I want more money for the, you know, what we've achieved for you. So if there's some way we can work in some sort of percentage bonus based on performance, I would, you know, work that into the deal in some way or another. How, how would you approach it though? You know, because I, I do know a few people who do those types of deals with their agency and it's kind of a, it's a, tr- it's a slippery slope, you know, because mm-hmm. it's like, okay, well, I'm going to pay you less uh, or the clients will say that I'll pay you less because now you're incentivized to help me close deals. But Mm -hmm. now, of course, those deals are contingent upon me, my ability to actually close. And a lot of times you you could hand the client like a smoking good, like hot prospect that says, I'm ready to give you money. And a lot of them will find a way to fuck it up. Like it's amazing how people fuck up deals. So it's, it's hard to find a balance or it's hard to find those clients that are willing to pay you the monthly that you want and layer on the residual. Yeah. And you know, another alternative would be some sort of tiered pricing system, right? Like a lot of the agencies in like the Facebook ad world do this where it's, you know, $2,000 a month and that gets you up to 5,000 a month in ad in ad spend management. Right. Mm -hmm. And then if you go to from 10,000 a month in ad spend uh, to 20,000 a month in ad spend, uh, our retainer goes up to three grand and you know, you can do some sort of tiered system. That'd be one of the things that would come to mind Again, it all comes down to setting those expectations from day one mm-hmm. of, of what's going to happen. Another uh, uh, option is like the, the, what, the part that I put out there is like, hey, maybe we'll do a test on your behalf. And, and I'm talking more like a digital agency or not agency, but a digital business that, you know, is maybe more in the software game. So if you're an agency looking to help someone who really the sales are made right there on the page or maybe mm-hmm. with some simple email follow ups, not necessarily someone on a phone call, let's say, or someone mm-hmm. closing a client, um, 
you know, like the scenario I put out there could be good for someone who has some capital to put into it. They know they have a process that works. Mm -hmm. I think that's really cool. But again, yeah, if it's someone starting out, then you need some money now and a good retainer helps. Uh, for sure. If you do want to add in a bump, I mean, you could always do make sure that uh, there's always a baseline so the client doesn't feel like they're ever going to lose out on anything. They're never going to make less than what they're currently, you know, the revenue is. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that, that's a lot of deals that you can do there. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you could definitely do something like that. Uh, the, the other thing um, that there was, I, I just had something that I was going to bring up that was kind of along those same lines, but I just lost it. So maybe I'll circle back around to it. <laughs> <laughs> Damn you, Matt. That was like going to be the most important part of the whole show. And you really, know, <laughs> it, it, it really was. I mean, I, it was, it was an amazing idea and um, billion dollar, the billion dollar game changer. Podcast yeah. That wasn't <laughs> like going back. I mean, over communicating, I think over anything, like you said, Matt, over communicating with your clients, like you can't go wrong. And, there was like one client specifically we had where we were like, we thought we were knocking it out of the park. And then like you said, Matt, there were a couple of things we just didn't communicate and make super clear that we did. We did. Yeah. Well. So the other, the other piece of advice I would, I yeah. would give like just based on our, our past experience, like one more thing I would do differently now is I would be super like niche focused. Yes. I would say like we handle the content marketing for uh, online SaaS companies right? Mm -hmm. Like I would just be super niche because then you can figure out like um, a process that just works consistently for SaaS entrepreneurs, right? Let's yeah. say you come up with a strategy that's like, if I make these 10 pieces of content and this 10 day follow-up sequence for them and this added strategy for them, then I know that I pretty consistently close this many SaaS deals on a daily basis. And I can just go replicate that in any SaaS company that hires me. In the past, when we had our agency, we had clients in the MLM space. We had clients uh, that were selling supplements. We had clients that were actually physical doctor's offices. We had mm -hmm. uh, dentists as clients. We had, you know, it was just anybody who wanted to be a client could be a client if we thought like, <laughs> if, if they had enough money to pay us, right? Yeah. <laughs> like if you were willing to pay us, you could be a client. I think now we would be real strict about like, this is our ideal client. We don't want anybody outside of that sort of scope. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I see a lot of agent, new, newer agency owners are always guilty of this. And I say that their niche is CC and P. Mm -hmm. With a credit card and a pulse. <laughs> 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 this other buddy of mine, he, he's, he's fairly new in his agency. Uh, he's growing, you know, he's going through the, you know, the first couple of years thing where, you know, he's, he's starting to grow, but he's not niched. And he's mm -hmm. like, he told me, he's like, niches are for bitches. <laughs> <laughs> it's like you gotta be better than that. <laughs> totally put that on a t-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. But That's when you think about it, though, you think about it. If you become known as the guy that knows how to 10x your SaaS company, every yeah. SaaS company that uses you is probably going to go refer you to every other SaaS company. Where yes. if you're just like that generalist, it's like I help any marketers with whatever marketing problem they have. Nobody ever thinks of you as like that guy to refer people to. Yeah, totally. And then back in the day when I did videos, it was sales videos. That was my niche, but it kind of like, it, it kind of evolved in, into anything, but I was known as that thing that people needed. No one else really niched down into that. So for that time, that period of time, it was very profitable. So yeah, that was awesome. And you got to work with some big names too, like uh, Huge. Frank, Frank Kern. All sorts of, yeah. I mean, all the, like the bigger internet marketers, usually in San Diego. And then it went into like the whole kind of um, personal development space. So a lot of those authors, a lot of New York Times bestsellers. It was cool. And a lot of them now are, have been on the podcast. We're like, cool, double dip a little bit, bring them onto our show now that we have one. That's awesome, man. Yeah. All right, guys, we're just about out of time. So I want to, first of all, thank you all so much for going on my little podcast. I know you guys are like the big deal now and everything, but I appreciate <laughs> you coming on. Sure. Uh, second thing is, when are you guys going to come back down to TJ and hang out and eat some tacos? Uh, Do it. Soon, actually. I got an invite to go down there on Saturday from another buddy of ours to go to the, the football game. Now. Are you going to go to that game? It's a huge game, actually. So by Maybe. the time this goes out, you know, the results will already happen. But uh, TJ, uh, the, the Cholos team, which is the name of the team here, and, and TJ, uh, they're playing the – so I think they're in eighth place, and they're playing the ninth place team. Okay. Um, and this is the last game before the playoffs. So if, uh, if the Tijuana team ties or wins, they will be going to the playoffs. Um, ah, 
Uh, so, yeah, my brother's actually coming down. We were thinking about going to the game. So, if we do. Well, if I do, I will let you know. I have not even uh, looked into the date yet. I just saw it. I was like, oh, that's interesting now that we're talking to Chris. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Well, either way, you know, we can come meet up. Uh, yeah. My place is not that far from the stadium anyway. right there. Yeah. yeah, exactly. yeah. And we haven't seen the – I mean, we saw the new building, but it was, uh, it was a shell when we were there. Yeah, you got to see it now. We've added a lot of cool things. I can so. see a little bit already, some writing and stuff. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. it's cool. I, I'm not going to reveal anything else to you guys until you get down here. <laughs> All right. So okay. what's the best way for, uh, for people to get in contact with you guys? Uh, just evergreenprofits.com, hustleandflowchart.com. Uh, mm -hmm. pretty much both of those links will take you to the same place because we just everything is all centralized but uh yeah if you go to evergreenprofits.com or hustleandflowchart.com whichever one you remember better go to one of those links perfecto and yeah. who is the perfect person to reach out to you guys today Ooh, the perfect person well what would they let's say we don't People usually, I would say a first good touch is the podcast because you get to know us a little bit more. Uh, it's kind of like this show or just it's a conversational thing. I would say any business owner who has a team who's looking to ramp up their, could be their podcasting traffic, uh, just content marketing in general. That's like, those are the core things that we're really good at. Yeah. If you love listening to podcasts and you like listening to, you know, marketing tactics and strategies and processes mm -hmm. that you can implement in your business. You know, that's our ideal listener of the podcast. And uh, if you get into the podcast, that's really all we ask people right now is go listen to the show and see what you think. Yeah, you know, learn a lot. Some, for free. You have some huge names on the show. Basically, everybody in digital marketing is lined up or has gone on your show. Just that's our goal. It's weird, man. It's getting really interesting because like I was saying, these are all like mentors of ours. And now we're like, holy crap. Ryan yeah. Dice is yeah. super anxious to be on the show because he just booked in for a second time. Really? Pretty yes, he booked in. He is booked in now to interview with us on two separate dates. I think it's an oversight, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> he makes didn't know that. <laughs> That's yeah. great. Well, you guys have to come down. I want to be on the show for a second time now, and we'll do it from our office in TJ Let's while yeah. drinking tequila and wearing the wrestling masks. Boom! <laughs> mic drop. Best show ever. Let's do it. <laughs> I love it. I'll bring my mask because I have it. Yeah, awesome. Is, awesome. All right. Well, thanks again for joining thank us. You, and to all of our listeners, thank you guys for tuning in today and make sure that you return next Thursday and every Thursday for the next episode of Operation Agency Freedom. Thank you guys so much. Have a great day. Bye-bye.